This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everyone and welcome to this afternoon's Sunset Safari. My name is Scott and we are in the Sabi Sands in South Africa. As you can see, I am on foot and what we are hoping on doing is going and searching for a female leopard. We know that she's got a den site on an area of the property, so we don't want to go close to that because she's very, very protective of the little cubs that she has hidden away there. But maybe she's headed off to try and find a meal and that is what we are hoping for, to find her tracks and then try and track her down. It'll take us about 20 minutes to get into that general area. I must say a very special welcome to the three special schools joining us, Ocean View, Newcastle and Catawba. It's wonderful to have you guys with us, so please send through questions using the hashtag Safari Live. This is coming to you live from South Africa, so we can chat with you as we go about the safari. Good stuff, we're going to send you off to Tristan, who's found a beautiful bird. I have indeed, Scott, I've got one of the most beautiful birds that comes here in our summer months, and that's because it's coming down for the rains. We get rain in our summer months, which means that these birds come down to feed off all of the insects, and it's called kingfisher, and we know it's a woodland kingfisher by that black eye stripe, those bright blue turquoise feathers, and that black and red beak that's very large that they use to fight off all kinds of things and grab insects and small mice and everything else that they have in their particular area. Now it is a very, very warm welcome to the schools that are joining us this afternoon. I hope that you'll have a wonderful time with us and that you'll see lots of interesting things ask as many questions as you can and give them to your teacher and she'll send them through to us. It's hopefully going to be a really good afternoon. I'm going to try and see if I can find a leopard that I haven't seen in quite some time. So I'm going to be heading all the way to our eastern side and see if there's a big male leopard that's going to be hanging around there. So that's the plan for the afternoon. Hopefully it will be a good one. The nice thing is also is that it's a little bit overcast and grey, which means that a lot of the predators, so things like leopard and lions and all the others, might be active during this afternoon. So we we're going to try and see if we can find them. But talking about predators, I believe Ralph, who's also out and about, has found one of the most endangered and rare predators that we have here in South Africa. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the afternoon game drive. Look what we've managed to find, you guys. Here's some wild dogs. And my name is Ralph Kirsten, and on the camera we've got Senzo. Thanks, Senzo. Folks, this is such a lovely opportunity for us. It's a lovely, cool afternoon. It's about 21 degrees centigrade, 80, 87 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere around there. But it's, it's, it's changing all the time because there's a bit of wind around. And, oh, sorry for that. It's actually the other way around. It's 27 degrees centigrade and 81 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you know how much that is in terms of the warmth, it's not that... It's not that hot and it's not that cold, especially with a little bit of a breeze coming through. And these dogs, they are a little bit quiet. They, were, they did all jump up a minute ago and they were giving each other a little bit of greetings and saying hello, a little bit of whimpering and carrying on. But for now they've gone and they lay down again. Now please everybody, send your, your questions through your teachers and for everybody else on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Taylor asking the question, why do we all go on safari? Well, Taylor, 
this is the exact reason why we go on safari so that we can see amazing animals like these wild dogs and they're all part of a big group they're all a fantastic team and they need to keep on letting each other know that they're part of the team so if you see one get up you'll see them all jump up and start greeting each other saying hello a little bit of whimpering like your dogs might do at home if you've got more than one dog at home you'll of often see them communicating with each other talking to each other little squeaks and growls and all sorts but all very important for them to establish who's who in the zoo but uh, wild dogs are normally very active and when we see them move they're generally going to go and start hunting so i think we're going to spend some time with these animals now and see if if they get up then we can follow them and see what they get up to we've got to be very fast because wild dogs move very quickly and depending on where you're from some people in some areas especially in the areas of britain they will call these painted dogs but we out here in south africa we call them wild dogs now they're not actually the same as your dog at home the dogs at home are more close to the wild wolves that we had but these are also coming from the same origin the canids but uh, these are these are not as close to the the domestic dog as the the wolves that you would find in the mountains and in north america very big ears allowing them to be able to hear but at the moment they're a little bit scared because with the wind they can't hear as well so there might be lions moving around and they need to pick that up with their big ears and it makes it difficult with the with the wind being blowing through so they are a little bit skittish Anna asking the question what do wild dogs hunt well they will hunt anything that they can really catch and generally it's it's around the size of an impala that's that's the general size but they will hunt warthog they will hunt scrub hares little rabbit type uh, creatures they'll also hunt nyala uh, males and females uh, they'll hunt even uh, young zebra and wildebeest so they've got a very varied diet but they mostly go for impala so we're going to stay here and see what these wild dogs get up to but in the meantime let's go over to james who i think has got some elephant to show you have you with us here in south africa a little bit difficult with our signal here that means there might be a bit of break up in the picture but we've got some elephants over here and they're just walking off down towards a dry riverbed and they're a little bit nervous and they're a little bit nervous I'm sorry about this pole there's nothing I can do about it we just have a roof on they're a little bit nervous because it is probably or it might be raining soon and this wind makes them nervous elephants don't like the wind many of the animals out here don't like the wind it makes them very scared because they can't hear if there are predators coming to get them there we go Now, Mrs. Norrell, you're wondering about the heat of this area and how hot it gets during the day here. Hello, Mrs. Norrell. My name is James. It's lovely to have you with us, with your classes. Uh, Mrs. Norrell, it gets probably to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit every so often, so just over 40 degrees Celsius, which is, of course, very hot indeed, uh, very sweaty. But today, and in fact for the last week or so it's been relatively mild during there about 26 degrees celsius or so 80 fahrenheit plus minus uh, we think that there's some weather some rain coming i'm going to try and move the car and get up to those elephants again if we do lose signal in other words if the screen does jump a bit and go black i'm sorry about that but there's nothing i can do All right, I can see the to the right-hand side. Fergus is on camera, so if I start talking to Fergus, well, then you know I'm talking to the cameraman, not some classmate you didn't realize was sitting next to you. 
Very unusual to have a classmate called Fergus. They don't normally go to school, says Fergus. Well, he's absolutely right. He went to a school, but whether one could actually describe it as a school or not is moot. Okay, here they are. Here's a really nice picture of them. How's that, Ferg? Right behind the bush. Dreadful. No, it's okay. Okay, so there's an elephant cow, and that means a female, a mother elephant, and she will have babies in this little group with her. Some of them will be hers. Some of them she will be an aunt to. So you will find that all of the adults in this group will be females, will be mothers, and they will be aunts and mothers and sisters to all the little ones. So there are no big bulls, no big daddy elephants in this herd. Ooh, now Catherine, you ask a very interesting question that I think if you think about it carefully, you'll be able to answer yourself. You say, why do elephants travel in a group? Well, Catherine, I want you to think about when you are on the playground, when you're playing during your recess or during your break time, and I want you to think about whether or not you like to sit on your own or whether you like to play with other children. And also, I want you to think about the way we as human beings live. Do we live alone or do we live in groups? Now you know how the comfort, you or you know you get comfort from being around other people. It's nice to be around other people. They make you feel safe, don't they? And the whole point of elephants being together is that it helps them to feel safe. So imagine you were walking somewhere in a big city, wherever you live, downtown, on your own. Imagine how unsafe you would feel. But imagine how much safer you would feel, especially as a youngster like you guys all are. Imagine how much safer you would feel with some adults. Well, that's the same for the elephants and same for many animals out here. They like to live in groups to help them stay safe. And Thomas, you're wondering how the elephants hide. Another very good question, Thomas. Look at them there. And they're enormous, aren't they? See how huge they are? But look how quickly they disappear. So they hide by being the most clever color you can be out here, Thomas. Gray is a very good color. And it's very easy to hide behind bushes if you are gray. Can you see that? Now we're looking straight at big elephants, some of them up to 10,000 pounds, and yet we can hardly see them. So they hide by being grey, but remember, elephants are very big, so they don't need to hide, because often other animals can't come and get them, so lions and hyenas will struggle to get hold of them. And Sophia, well, as I was sort of mentioning there, but I wasn't clear, I said elephants can weigh up to 10,000 pounds in that group, well, a female elephant weighs about four and a half thousand kilograms or 10,000 pounds. So that's a huge amount. A big bull elephant, even heavier than that, up to about 14,000 pounds, six tons. Isn't that amazing? That is absolutely massive. And if you, when you one day get very good at maths, you might be able to work out how many kids in the class that would take. So I'm just going to quickly do the maths for you. 20 kids, let's say, roughly 20 kilograms each. So you weigh in at about 400 kilograms, the whole class of you. So it would take 10 classrooms of you to make up one female elephant. Isn't that unbelievable? While you think of that maths, let's go across to Ralph and his dogs. Okay, everybody, so we're still sitting here with the dogs and they're getting up and walking around a little bit and then laying back down again. Like I said, this wind still picking up, getting quite strong. So it does make them lift up their heads every now and then and just try and listen out for anything. It's quite difficult for them to hear any of the surrounding noises now with the trees rustling with their leaves. So it's all quite a little bit nervous, nervous time for them. But uh, I do believe that if we sit here for a little while, we're going to see them move around. Ali asking the question, which is a very good question, how long do wild dogs sleep for? Well, Ali, it's not quite as 
as much as you would you would find lions sleeping like 20 hours a day wild dogs will they will move around a lot more than lions and sometimes leopard although leopard can move around quite quite regularly as well and sometimes during the day too and sorry for that pole that is just over there we do have the rain cover up just in case it might rain so wild dogs they can sleep pretty much like your dogs at home but they are quite fit and quite good athletes so they they do when they move they they move very fast and I would say they're probably up about f about eight hours a day at least running around looking for food and a pack like this they can eat two to three impala a day so they've got a lot of mouths to feed so while we sit here and wait for them to get active let's go over to Scott who's got a praying mantis for you We certainly do have a mantis. It's a absolutely tiny one. And this is as big as these little flower mantids get. And we've seen quite a few of them around. And what's interesting with them is that they usually like spending time on the same little bush. And that's obviously because they know the bush has got little flowers on it that a lot of insects are attracted to. And these little critters are absolutely incredible predators. Just like the wild dogs you've been seeing with Ralph, these guys are probably the most effective and ferocious predators of all of the different types of insects that do hunt prey and what you may notice is that it's got four legs at the back that it uses for walking and jumping oh there we go it just did a wonderful jump it's just moved off a little bit this is the little waltheria plant that they like spending time on it's back on its usual perch and you'll also notice that its front two legs are held up and that's what gives them their name the praying mantid or praying mantis because it looks like they're praying but they're certainly not praying they are waiting in ambush and what they'll do is use those front legs to latch out and catch their prey what's also interesting with them is that they are the only insects that have the ability to move their head from side to side without moving their body and you can see this little guy doing that right now looking for any possible prey that it can catch very very cool isn't that good well even though we are searching for a leopard we are going to stop along the way if we do find you any little interesting critters in the meantime we'll be sending you back to Tristan Well, I should hope so, Scotty. There's lots of interesting and amazing things that lurk all around the bush, and particularly when you're walking around, you're able to see all of these little things. Now, when we're looking for leopards, as Scott was talking about, and how what we were talking about earlier, then it's always good to check areas like where we are now. We want to try and get into the thick riverbed systems where there's lots of vegetation and it's very very good then for leopards to hide and to camouflage now camouflage means an area where they are able to come or have a system that they're able to hide away from prey species so that's the spots that the leopard has those spots work well to be able to blend into the light and build sort of sun and shade that we get in these areas and so that's why it's a really good place to look for them. I always like driving in these areas when I'm on a search for a leopard because they often tend to hang around in these sections. So I'm going towards the eastern side. Okay, everybody, sorry about that. Don't know what happened with Tristan while he's driving through the river there. The signal does get a little bit difficult, but we're still sitting here waiting for these wild dogs to get up and move around. And while we're doing that, please send through your questions and your comments. Let's get this as interactive as possible. And I'll uh, give you all the little info and tidbits that I know in the meantime. Now, what's quite special about these these dogs or these animals is that they will find a den site when they when they want to breed and um, what they will do is they normally go into something like an ant bear burrow ant bears make burrows all over the place and they can make a new burrow every night and then they move off the next day or the next evening because they move around at night so wild dogs can use these holes as dens
Phoenix asking a very good question why are these wild dogs all huddled up in a group well there there's there's a couple of groups here and one lying off in the middle there as you can see but they they lie in groups they lie on each other they like to touch each other quite regularly because it keeps that social bond and their, and their friends uh, uh, in the group they keep that str that bond very strong and also at the moment we also do have quite a strong breeze coming through here and I know that it doesn't it wouldn't seem that it's that cold being at about uh, 81 degrees Fahrenheit but it it is quite uh, a lot cooler than that with the wind so they might also be staying a little bit warm and if there are lots of bodies around lots of dogs around and they lie together they can stay nice and warm and when they lie in a group like that as well each one pointing in a different direction they can see something happening on an, on another side you know so it all helps for them keeping warm to keep their bond very tight and also to be able to see anything coming in a different direction Alavim asking, is the wild dog related to a fox? Yes, but quite distantly. He's not very closely related, but uh, he's part of, the, part of the canids, so they are of a similar breeding, but um, a little bit further away than, than the wild dogs, or, or the, uh, the wild dogs are closer to the foxes than they would be to the, to the wolves and the, and the domestic dogs. So, not too far off, but but not they wouldn't be able to breed together Dela asking a question are the dogs friendly or dangerous well Dela with these animals being wild like the name says wild dogs they they are not very friendly but they're not very dangerous either because I've come across some of these dogs while I've been on foot as well or while I was walking and they are a little bit scared of you as well so they're not they're not very dangerous to us but they can be very dangerous to the impala and things that they eat because they would have to kill them before they do that so they're not dangerous to us but they are dangerous to lots of other animals because they are very good hunters. They are even better than cheetah and lions. So these are one of the best hunters that you can find in the bush. And once they go for something, they normally always catch it. Dave asking the question, how fast can the dogs run? Now that's that's a very good question. If Oh, excuse me, not Dave, it's Gabe, uh, very close, but uh, Gabe, the, these wild dogs, they can probably run between 60 and 70 kilometers an hour, and that's, if you, if you say in miles, that's at about 30, 35 miles per hour, but they don't do that just for a very short period of time, they can do that for very long, and what they will do is, they will put one dog in front that runs very close to the to the animal that they're chasing and as fast as he can and when he gets tired he falls to the back and another one goes very fast is very similar to the way that wolves will hunt and they they can also come from every angle and try and corner an animal so they've got a, a lot of tactics because they've got so many animals in the group they've got many things that they can do but mostly they can run at a very fast speed and they can also go for a very long time so at the moment they're not moving around much at all and you wouldn't think that they're that fast would you with them lying like that but they do need to rest up they need to get some energy before they generally stand up and immediately go into the run so this time is actually very important when they they're getting their energy back because when dogs stand up they are very fast Michelle asking the question is this a group of females or males now it's a group of about 10 about 10 dogs and it's very difficult to see the difference between uh, girl and boy or male and female dogs but uh, they would have to stand up and once you once they stand up it's like looking to see if a dog is a is a male or female that's the only way you can't you can't tell 
from their from their head or from their bodies the the males and females heads are slightly different but it's very difficult to tell just by looking at, it, at them like that so there are males and females here there's normally quite a good mix of them i would say it's, it's normally very close to half half but uh, at the moment i don't know how many males and females are in this in this group of dogs or in this pack of dogs but it's all very exciting at the moment not much happening but I'm sure that as soon as these dogs stand up, we're going to have lots of action. And I'm going to be right here with Senzo to bring it to you. Calum asking a very good question. Do the dogs have good hearing? Now, Calum, if you look at the size of those ears, that is the way that they catch the sounds coming moving through the air so with them having such big ears like that it's normally an indication that they are excellent hearers so yes if you look at a little fox-like animal called the bat-eared fox they also have very big ears like that and they put them close to the ground because they hunt little insects and things in in the soil underneath the ground and they need to be able to hear those little insects moving under under the ground and, and then they dig them out but the wild dogs it's more about hearing the other big predators like lions and leopard coming through the grass or they want to hear if there's any impala young kudu nyala anything moving through the bush and they can then pick that up and with so many ears and so many such big ears like that, they can pick up the sounds very quickly. And they all work together with that as well. It's always better working in a team. The leopards generally work alone, but the wild dogs work together. Mrs. Noll asking the question, what predators do the wild dogs have? Well, it's generally all the other predators if they come across any of these wild dogs like uh, lion and leopard they will they will also attack them because it's it's competition because these wild dogs are also catching the same food that the, the lion and leopard would potentially be going for so they don't want to compete with the wild dogs and if they have the chance they will they will kill them and uh, we've we've seen quite regularly when lions come across a wild dog den it's, uh, it's very unfortunate, but you do see a lot of the youngsters getting killed by lions. And it can happen with leopard too. So, nothing happening here just yet. But while we sit in the wind, and hopefully it dies down shortly, Scott's out on foot. And I wonder how windy it is where he is. It is very, very windy and because we are on foot we're thinking of possibly changing our plans and staying a little bit closer to camp so we don't get caught in a potential rainstorm. Lots of clouds all around us. Now, even though we've been looking up into the sky at the weather, we've also been keeping a very close eye on the ground because the bush telegraph is left on the earth and what we can find is lots of tracks and signs of where animals have been and get insights into what they've been up to. Now over here you can see there's some earth that's been excavated and over here you can see some roots that are sticking out and next to these roots you can see a few bits of plant fiber and this would have been a whole big bulb like a potato and the animal that's responsible for digging out and moving all this earth is an elephant. And the reason we know that it's an elephant and not a porcupine is because if we look over here, we can see a huge footprint of where an elephant stood. Look at how big its foot is, starting at the front there all the way back to here. Quite oval in shape, not perfectly round. And it also goes to show how good the elephant's sense of smell is because they wouldn't have been able to see that potato-like bulb it was under the ground but the incredibly sensitive trunk would have been able to smell it and then they would have used their big powerful legs to dig out the earth and get to the treasure that they were looking for now it doesn't look very fresh I can tell that because the soil has solidified quite a bit it's not very soft even here if I break it it'll break like a cookie as opposed to being soft and pliable so probably from a few days ago 
And it's very important to remember that if there are fresh signs of elephants, you need to be very, very careful because you don't want to run into them. They can be very dangerous when we are on foot. And Mark, you would like to know if I've ever been chased by any animals, and if so, what did I do? Well, nine times out of ten, Mark, when you get chased by an animal, the best thing to do is stand your ground and make yourself look as big as possible and shout, and by standing your ground, you're going to make even a big animal like an elephant think twice about attacking you. But if you turn and start running, immediately that elephant or whatever the animal is, a lion or a leopard, is going to feel more powerful than you, and it's going to continue to chase you. So your best thing to do is stand your ground with most of the animals, but there are certain animals like the Cape Buffalo that if you stand your ground, you're just going to be a sitting target for it. But the thing is, we know what we're doing. We know how to avoid getting too close to the animals to make them feel scared. And we also do have Herbie with us, who's a master tracker. He does have a rifle in case we do get into a situation where we may need to stop an animal. But in all of the years that Herb's been on foot, as well as I've been on foot, it's 27 years in total, we've never had to shoot an animal. Very, very good. Well... We're going to continue. I think it's kind of cleared up, so we're going to keep trying to go towards where we're hoping to find this female leopard. And if we get wet, so be it. Okay, well, I don't think you guys have met James yet. He's about to arrive at a water hole, so why don't you go and see what he's going to get up to. We have got a very special bird here, everybody. It's a big bird, and it's just landed. I'm going to see if I can go a bit forward, and I'll tell you how we found it now. I'm just going to sneak forward, Ferg. Is it still there? All right, while we try and find out what's going on here, apparently the dogs are getting up. Have you got him there? Hole. Yes, everybody, the, the dogs have gotten up, but they, they're all going through so all the, the emotions of, of rubbing up against each other, lots of squeaking, lots of calling to each other, and lots of feeling, feeling each other out, snuggling up to each other, and now that they've gone back down to ground again, and I think it's mostly to do with this wind. They are getting cold, they are feeling it a little bit, as are we. I've even rolled down my sleeves. It's getting a little bit cool out here. But uh, that's, always, that's not always such a bad thing because predators like to move around when it's nice and cool. Much easier for them to, to move around as, as it would be you. You know, when it's very hot in the middle of the day, it's a lot harder work if you want to go and do heavy lifting outside or you need to fix something. You'd rather do it when it's a little bit cooler in the morning or the late afternoon. So that's the same with these guys. So on a day like this, they might move around a little bit more. And that's why every now and then they get up, they, they talk to each other again, they rub up against each other, they put their noses up against each other, rub up their sides along each other. And that's all part of the team re-establishing everybody in the rightful place. Okay, we're going to go back to James in the meantime, and we'll see what happens with these dogs, but he's got a lovely bird to show you. Right, hello everybody. We did find this bird again. It looks to me like what we call a juvenile Wahlberg's eagle. That means he's a young Wahlberg's eagle. I'm just going to try and sneak forward. I don't want to start the engine to make him frightened and make him fly away. But I think I'm going to have to. There he is. Now, do you know how I know how he's a youngster? Well, it's because his fur is all untidy. You know how you have to have a bath every day? Well, the birds are just the same. I know your parents never seem like they're dirty. Well, young birds are exactly like young people. They always look a bit scruffy and dirty, look like they need a bath. So this young bird has probably left the nest I don't know when he looks a bit old to have just left it this season, so it must be he's probably just over a year old, or just about to be a year old. They breed every year here in South Africa, and this is the Wahlberg's eagle. 
Ow, ow. And we found him because those other birds that I showed you just before you went back to the wild dogs were calling. There, we've got one there, right in front of us there, folk. They're called helmeted guinea fowl. And they're very cross. They're very angry because those birds, those Wahlberg's eagles, like to eat guinea fowls if they can catch them. And so the guinea fowls are going... <laughs> saying to each other, watch out, watch out, there's Wahlberg's eagle, it's going to eat us, go away, Wahlberg's eagle, please don't eat us. Isn't that amazing? So it's really very exciting to look not only at the dogs and the elephants and that sort of thing, but at the birds. They're very special indeed. Now I'm afraid I can't hear a thing from the director at the moment, so I'm going to have to ask Fergus to help me. Fergus, you've got no idea either. Seb? No? Okay. Well, <laughs> don't know what to do. Might have to crash cut. Try again. There we go. Are we on live? On we on air? You are live, hello. We are still live. Okay, I don't know why my radio is not working properly. We're going down towards a big water hole over here. You're going to come with us. And we'll see what we can find down there. If you're wondering what this thing is over here, it's what we call a little drone. And that means that it's a little miniature helicopter that we put a camera on and we might fly it later on today but there's a lot of wind and weather so we might not either. Okay, let's drive slowly across this way and to the wards the waterhole. We just have to go up onto a road. What is the smallest animal in South Africa? Oh, now Kevin, you want to know what the smallest animal in South Africa is. Well, Kevin, you must remember that animals include all the things like insects. So I suppose a really small animal might be something like an ant. That would be the smallest animal that we get in South Africa. But I'm, I'm guessing that you mean mammal. So things like uh, an antelope or in this case, a rodent. The smallest mammal in South Africa would probably be something like a rodent, like a little Bushveld gerbil. There are some impala trying to hide from us. There's some little ones in front of us. We can have a look at those ones there. There's a mother, it looks like a youngster. There they are, two females. Look how windy it is. And I'll tell you, that the air is starting to smell like rain. You know that funny wet smell that the land gets when it rains? Well, that's what it smells like here. So I think our smallest animal out here would be probably something like a Bushveld gerbil, which looks like a little hamster, or a shrew, which is also a little bit like a hopping hamster, but much smaller. Okay, we're going to carry on down towards the water, and while we do that, Tristan has got himself a scavenger in the sky. I do indeed, James. I've got a scavenger that is sitting out top a very windy treetop and is being blown around all over the place. This is a white-backed vulture, and these are the most common vultures that we get here in this particular part of South Africa. And you can see that it's actually sitting atop a nest. So these vultures do nest in this area. This particular pair of vultures has been nesting in this very same tree for the last seven years that I know of, at least. They might have even been nesting before there but for the last seven years this is where they've had their nest in fact actually their nest has moved a little bit they used to have the nest in the middle of the tree and they've now put it up right at the top and you can actually see 
um, that there is a little chick there on the nest itself. You see it's moving there just below the adult. There seems to be something that's moving. There it is. You see it going up and down. So there's the chick inside there. Now this chick is quite small for this time of the year. Normally vultures start breeding in around June, July and they will then incubate those eggs for about 44 days before that little one hatches and then it stays in the nest for about 180 days until it can fly. So it's a very long period that these birds have to look after their young ones. It's much longer than most others. But this little chick seems quite small so maybe it was the egg was laid a little bit later in the year and maybe more towards August because it doesn't seem like it is fully grown just yet which is quite interesting. It's also interesting where this nest has been built. Normally white-backed vultures don't like to build their nest right at the top of the tree. They like to build their nest more in the middle of the tree so if you see that tree it's got a fork in it. That fork is where they used to nest and it's now seems as though they've moved up to the top right hand side and so interesting it's a very high nest as well that's why it's so windy up there and that poor vulture is having to balance as much as possible. Now the thing with that vulture sitting there is it doesn't mean that there's anything dead anywhere in this area. It means that there's a situation that it's just nesting. What we're going to do from here though is we're going to go up this long road and then we're going to go around and try and see if we can find this male leopard from earlier today and see if we can find it. Now Kayla I think I heard your question correctly but it, I believe you were asking do, are there some types of animals that detect other animals? Ah, protect other animals. So, Kayla, not out of willingness. So, basically how it works is that some animals will protect others by watching and by looking and uh, providing an alarm call, let's say. So, in a situation where, let's, let's talk about our leopard walking through here, then maybe an impala sees that leopard and it will start shouting and it will then basically snort and make a noise so that all the other antelope and all the other animals out here know that there's a dangerous animal. So it's not that they are directly protecting um, different animals but they are trying to help and tell everyone that there is danger here. And you'll also find things like if a, if a lion let's say attacks a buffalo then you'll find the rest of the herd will try and help that one and try and chase those lions away or there will be a situation where an elephant might be there and because of all the movement the elephant gets a bit upset and then it comes and chases the lions as well so it does happen from time to time but it's not normally from a different species you'll find when there's protection happening it's normally the same species so buffalo will help buffalo and impalas will snort for other impalas it's not really designed to be able to to tell everybody else and protect everybody else from those things but hopefully we will hear one of those animals shouting because that will help us find our leopard. Leopards are notoriously tough to find. They're quite shy and, and difficult to see. And so hopefully we'll have a sign of some animal shouting or alarm calling that will lead us to our spotty friend. But while we think about that, let's go back to Ralph and those crazy wild dogs and see if they've decided to wake up yet. Well, they definitely have decided to wake up. They've all jumped up, and like I said before, they're all running around, greeting each other. You can see that there's one of them that they've got a tracking device on. Now, that might be the Kruger National Park doing a little bit of research and following their movements, seeing how far they actually move, over what distances, because it's very interesting to know how far these these wild dogs move and where they might be denning, etc. The more we know about them, the more they, we can... Uh, protect them now they're all doing that social bonding and they're starting to move around a little bit so that can be very exciting for us because when wild dog moves they generally start to hunt and they've all been stretching getting ready to run around so I'm gonna be getting ready to start the car and follow them as soon as they move Mia asking a good question, how many wild dogs normally in a group? Well, Mia, you don't generally get less than about five animals, and you can normally have up to about 30 of them. So this is a, a, a small to medium-sized group of wild dogs. There can be a lot more of them together, and they can eat anything from one to five impala a day. So there's lots of mouths m to feed, 
and they need to cover lots of distance and lots of ground chasing their food. Olivia asking the question, what do wild dogs' teeth look like? Very similar to that of your, of your domestic dog. They've got the incisors, they've got the canines, and they've also got those molars at the back. So they're able to bite into flesh, they're able to cut the flesh, and they're able to grind it as well at the back of their mouths. So they do also grind up a little bit of bone as well. So it's, it's incredible when you watch wild dogs eating their food, they finish almost everything and they do it very fast as well. They are, able, they are able to feed extremely quickly and they normally feed as fast as they can, finish all their food and then what they will do is they'll go back to the den if they've got any young ones and the, the, the young ones they come and they start to lick at the side of the mouth and uh, that's when they will regurgitate the food and then um, that's how the babies eat. So I'm just going to start up and we're just going to turn around so that we can get a better view here and also so that if these wild dogs start to move we can follow them very quickly because it can be very difficult to follow. So we're just going to we're just going to make a very good position here but uh, I'd like to thank all the kids from the elementary schools for joining us and uh, we hope that you join us again we've got a lovely view here of the wild dogs so I hope that I could answer some of your questions but thanks for coming and please do come back again so as we continue and, and how we've repositioned with these dogs we're always got to be ready I'm just answering somebody on the radio yes absolutely come in we do have to listen out for everybody that's speaking on the radio because obviously there's other people that also want to come and have a look and we want to allow everybody the chance to have a great view of these wild dogs uh, please don't forget the rest of the viewers to send in your questions, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat. And now that's how it works, eh? They can be extremely active and then they go to ground again. And they're all curling themselves into a lovely little ball. And that is obviously trying to keep themselves warm in this very cool breeze that is coming through. Now I believe that there is a frontal system approaching and it is very dark on the horizon if Senzo can just zoom out and just give us a look there that's what I'm talking about it is looking very ominous and I think if we don't have rain while we're out on drive we're definitely going to have rain maybe sometime this e evening tomorrow morning so I think for the next few days we're going to get a little bit wet nonetheless We've got some predators to, predators to watch and to follow. And we might get lots of movement going on with the predators. I love it when it gets a little bit colder because you do start to see the predators moving around a lot more than you would when it's very hot. So once again, we've gone back to flat dogs. Oh, as I've said that, look at that. They're up. They're on the move again. And we've got something happening here, folks. James Richard putting through the comment that you think this is the Investec pack. Thanks very much, James Richard. I'm, uh, Welcome to everybody that's just joined us. We've uh, we've been sitting watching these wild dogs, and they were very quiet and calm in the in the cool breeze. It's quite cool here at the moment, but uh, they've all been lying together, huddled together, lying down, being quiet, and keeping warm. But at the moment, they've all started to jump up, and there's been a little bit of action, lots of communicating. 
lots of rubbing up against each other. It's almost like they're getting ready for the hunt. So we can't guarantee that they will, but we always have to be ready with wild dogs because they go so quickly that anything can happen at any time. Holly giving a comment, how wonderful. I would, I would second that Holly and say it's absolutely amazing. We love watching painted dogs, wild dogs, especially once they start getting active because it generally results in a little animal getting eaten. Now, not that we're bloodthirsty, but it is one of the most amazing sights to watch in the bush and one of the apex predators that are extremely efficient at what they do. Now, it's quite confusing sometimes because they jump up, they're very active, and then they can go quiet again. Avis de Villiers commenting that this is your favorite carnivore. Well, one of mine too, because of their total efficiency. And once they pick up that there's an animal around and they move off on the hunt, it generally results in the hunt being finished with feeding. So that's why we always follow wild dogs when we can, when they move onto the property and we have enough chance to to actually keep up with them you know the trouble is is that once they run into the thickets it's very difficult to follow because they move so fast sorry I didn't quite get the name it sounded like rug rat but I don't want to say that Rasat, R-A-S-A-T, Rasat, I think it is. What is their life expectancy? Well, Rasat, they live normally between 6 and 12 years. So it's generally about the same time that you would uh, expect to have uh, your, uh, one of the bigger domestic dogs. Um, so 6 to 12 years, it's not an amazing amount of time, but with the athletism and the way that they career around uh, it, it, it's actually quite a long life uh, for that amount of energy to be expended and 12 15 years very good age for wild dogs Jay who have, having just locked in and uh, saying wow how beautiful they are absolutely and that's one of the reasons why they call them painted dogs because it really does look like they've been splashed at with all sorts of different colors of whites and orange and black and quite quite useful in trying to identify different individuals but it takes quite a bit of time staying with groups of wild dogs to actually realize the specific individual characteristics and and nature of them because they move around so much that it does become so difficult. Now Mark saying that he's he's never seen these before. Why do they have such big ears? Well, that's that's to do with them. You see how they point them forward like that? And that's pointing them in the direction to catch any of the sound coming from the direction that they're pointing them in. It makes them like satellite dishes in enabling them to to receive more sound coming through the air and that would be for their hunting purposes and defense trying to get away from predators now excuse that pole that you might see every now and then as we go past uh, with moisture and dust is like the predator of our electronic equipment and these poles are just like the horns of the antelope helping us protect our electronic equipment here so we, we really need to stay on these animals it's it's absolutely intriguing they they're almost waiting for just one of them to give the real go-ahead and they all seem to keep looking back and I'm trying to work out at who is actually the alpha pair leading this group. But as I say, you have to spend quite a bit of time with them. And then you can start to realize, realize who's in charge and who they're actually waiting for the command from. So we had one of the viewers saying that's the Investec 
pack. Rick Hunter asking why they're so active. Is there prey nearby? Well, Rick Hunter, they wild dogs. They, they generally go from doing nothing to doing everything all at once. So there's no real in-between with wild dogs. Um, but with there being a lot of wind at the moment, it's quite possible that they're picking up all sorts of smells of prey. But I think from experience, they do know with that when it's windy, it can be carrying that smell from quite a, a big distance. So they get excited because they get the smell, but then they sort of calm down again because they realize that it might be not as close as they thought now we have one individual that ran off on his own i'm not sure if it's a male or female at the moment i haven't been able to see but one individual ran off now looks like it's coming back to rejoin the group okay so everybody it does look like it's a female we're going to sit here with this group and see what happens. All right, so getting up lying down getting up lying down but still constantly reaffirming the bonds the little snappy snaps and the little squeaky squeaks all part of that very strong social knit that you get with wild dogs and there's also a little bit of aloe grooming and that kneading type that fleeing motion that they do with their with their teeth through the through the coats of each other and you see how some of them being very subordinate that's that looked like a female re I'm heading off oh, we might need to get ready to move it doesn't look like they've all jumped up very excitedly as if they're going to go off on a hunt they are however making me think that sooner or later they are going to because they're getting more and more active as we sit here so but what makes me think they're not ready just yet is that there are a couple of individuals four or so who are still curled up so from a couple of flat animals down on the ground James has got something else that that is very close to the ground let's go over to him Yes, we do indeed. We have got Ronald the Rover. That is his picture. He is sneaking up on the herd of waterbuck. Now, please remember, do keep talking to us using the hashtag Safari Live and the YouTube chat stream. And Ronald, you can see, making his way gently towards a gorgeous herd of waterbuck here. We have them on the other picture as well. Oh, he's a little bit stuck. Oh dear, I fear me, he's he's run out of range. No oh dear, his camera's breaking up. Look, he's not, he's actually doing very well. He's driving okay, but his camera is not very happy. Let's just keep going towards him. You can see his little oh. Let's go a little bit further. Unfortunately, his picture is now dead. Oh dear, no video link bed. Okay, sorry about that. I don't think it's, I think there's a problem with the camera, Ferg. I don't think it's him. Anyway, we'll go and see if we can retrieve him. We've got some water, some Nyala walking paths as well. And very windy conditions out here, and I suspect very good conditions actually for Ronald, if we could get his video to work properly. I think it would be perfect because really the wind will disguise his noise and because he makes a little noise as he moves what a great pity that he's unfortunately lost his uh, video signal anyway 
gorgeous waterbuck hanging around with some nyala. This is the most beautiful little clearing. There's also a wildebeest there. Can you see the wildebeest or was he behind the pole? Sorry about the pole. Remember everyone, we are just trying to protect our equipment from the elements. I don't think it's going to rain with such a strong wind blowing. Now I said this the other day and I wonder if anyone believes me or uh, uh, agrees with me, but I think that our wildebeest are better looking than the ones in East Africa. Many would disagree. Right, we're just going to... I've actually got Ronald moving again. No, but his pictures is not looking very good. Anyway, we'll go and fetch him in the car, I think. And we're going towards Nyala now. There he is. <laughs> I think I may have got him stuck. Yes, he's now run out of range. Anyway, very fun stuff. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> the other way around. That's it. Okay, let's see. Let's see if the Nyala is a bit braver than the waterbuck. <laughs> see his little his little antenna sticking out of the grass. So we'll see if we can get a sight of the wildebeest. There he's going towards the wildebeest and a lion's eye flower you can see between his antenna there. See how close we can get to this wildebeest. There's the lion's eye flower if you're looking on Ronald's feed and just behind just behind the lion's eye flower, we have got Ronald. Let's uh, move the side sideways a little bit. Now, you see how stealthy he is? How he sneaks up behind the bushes using available cover. Nicola, I didn't squash it. I promise. Nicky's directing us today. Uh, it'll it'll it just bounced up, you know, like when we run over Cambrian bushes with our cars. This wildebeest is fantastic. He's hardly reacting at all. Come on, Ron. Let's see how close we can get. This is the furthest Ronald has ever been from me. He's uh, really forging new ground here today. Come on, Ronald. The wildebeest definitely seems to be this slightly less aware of all of this bunch. Ooh, this is a wonderful picture of the wildebeest. Isn't that great? Oh, don't pixelate. Come on, hold it together. Uh, oh dear, he's gone, and I can't see him. <laughs> he's in there somewhere. Can you see him, Ferg? No, he's not moving there. I think he's to the left. Yes, somewhere in there. You see any movement? Anyway, maybe his video will come back, and we will continue our traverse towards the wildebeest. I'll tell you what we can do is we can just drive a little bit closer. This is Ronald's controller. We can just drive a little bit closer because we're not close enough to make those animals run from us. We'll just see if we can pick Ronald up. Still waiting for our picture to come back. Ah, there's Ron. I can see him, Ferg. He's not far off. There, his picture's back. It's parked like this. How's that, Ferg? Well, you say you're happy to see Ronald back in action. We're also very happy to see Ronald back in action. I think the wildebeest may have seen him now. Yes, Kathy, you're absolutely right. I am like a kid with a remote controlled car. It's been a long time since I owned a remote controlled car. I always used to break them after the first day. I just, no matter what I tried, I was hopeless at not breaking them. My brother has still got his 40 years later, odd, from when he was given them. Mine, disasters. No, his video feed's gone down again. What a pity.
Can you see him there anywhere, folks? I may have placed him right in that bush. Anyway, let's cruise up a little bit more. Come on, Ronnie. See, it was really working quite nicely because we got close without these animals running away from us at all. And ideally, we need to be your side, hey Ferg, but we can't be that side. So we will do this. No, no, he's much further away from us, isn't he? I think he's just in that little group of bushes over there. There he is. I can see him. <laughs> he's at a bit of an angle. How's that? Lady Staff, you've actually asked a very good question that probably has had many academic papers written about it while I drive Ronald towards the wildebeest. Um, you say, what is the difference in the average herd size of the animals in the Sabi sands, Nyala, I mean, antelope species, Nyala, wildebeest, uh, the tragolaphids, etc., etc.? Um, Lady Starfire, you will find the more open the area that the animal lives in, the larger the herd will be. And so, with the ex notable exception, I suppose, of the wildebeest, which tend not to occur in great numbers here. So you'll find small groups of Nyala, um, almost individuals of bushbuck, sometimes small groups, but they're largely solitary. Could do slightly larger herds, but not really much bigger, because of course they do live in, in thicker bush. And then the antelope of the plains, uh, the waterbuck, for example, tend to occur in slightly larger herds than the rest, and also, of course, the impala, for example, they will incur in large herds. It also de depends quite largely on the resources that are available. So in this area, there's lots of water, and so we get big herds of impala, but as you know, in the Masai Mara, we get much smaller herds of impala, and that's simply because they don't have water uh, as widely spread as here. They do have as much water, but it's not widely spread. <laughs> He's almost there, isn't he? Come on, Ron. Oh dear, he's stuck on a bush. Let me turn reverse slightly. Go forward, Ron. So, Ronald's screen I can see just behind me. In fact, I should probably be sitting slightly differently from the way that I am. <laughs> Come on, Ron. Don't give up now, buddy. You're nearly there. You're nearly about to create history, Ron. Oh dear, you're behind a bush and you seem to have picked up a stick. <laughs> Ronald has picked up a stick, everybody. He looks like he's uh, about to charge in like a, a, <laughs> a knight with a lance. There we are, we've lost his stick now. Now, Waterbuck, stand still. Here comes Ronald to say hello to you. Oh, 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 don't pixelate. We've got a problem with this camera, we might have to have it replaced. Burned at the stake. There we go. Hello, chaps. What are you looking at? So Ronald is now, of course, you can probably see there, not very far from these Waterbuck at all, only about 10 meters, I'd say, 30 feet or so. Two of them are, three of them are watching him quite carefully. We'll just now. <laughs> now, you could never get anything like as close to an animal like that on foot. That would be completely impossible. We're not going to go any further forward now because they're all just looking at him a bit suspiciously. But a slightly more sophisticated camera would get us a wonderful view of those waterbuck now walking past. They're suspicious that if something is up. And in fact, there's one... <laughs> oh, wow. Tristan has got what I was looking for very close to where we are, here. Well, I did, unfortunately, until 
a vehicle drove past. There was a leopard there, but it has run south, chasing after a warthog, so we're not going to be able to see it, unfortunately, which is very sad because it was moving north the whole time, and then eventually a warthog popped out and it ran off towards the warthog, which is very sad news for us.